Hi everyone, and welcome to the video lecture, Contemporary Classical and Deterrence Research. This video goes along with Chapter 4 of your textbook. In this lecture, we will discuss modern theories that utilize the deterrence and classical perspective. I want to take a minute to review the original deterrence theory, the classical school of criminology. Classical theorists argued that the crime was the result of a rational choice, where an offender would weigh the expected punishments against the expected rewards and then engage in a behavior based on the balance between the two. In order to deter criminal behavior, Beccaria argued that the punishments must be swift, certain, and severe, meaning that the offender must expect punishment to occur soon, every time the behavior is done, and to have a punishment in proportion with the behavior. Remember that Beccaria also maintained that punishments needed to be fair, otherwise they would be seen as tyrannical and the individual would no longer be deterred. Classical theorists propose two types of deterrence, specific and general. Specific deterrence means that the individual themselves is deterred from future criminal behavior, whereas general deterrence means that other people would also be deterred based on a single person's punishment. Although modern theories have diverged from the original classical theories in some ways, the basic assumptions of deterrence-based theories still hold true in modern versions. One of the challenges for deterrence research is examining the decision-making process that a person goes through before they commit an offense. How do we know that an individual is weighing the punishments versus the rewards? How do we learn what they are focused on in regards to the punishment? Are they thinking about the severity or just the certainty of punishment? Deterrence researchers, along with a majority of other criminologists, have used multiple methods of collecting data to answer these questions. The first studies were done on an aggregate basis, meaning that researchers were studying behavior at the macro level and not looking at individual people. This method is helpful for identifying trends, but make cause and effect identification difficult because you never talk to people about their own perceptions and attitudes. Cross-sectional research, which comes next, looks at people at one point in time. The advantage of this research is that it can be done on an individual level, meaning you are talking to people about how they think, feel, and act. The most common type of cross-sectional research used for deterrence research is the self-report questionnaire, which asks people to report things about themselves. For example, a cross-sectional study done on people who'd been convicted of shoplifting would ask things like, did you expect to get caught before you committed the crime? Or what type of punishment did you think you would get? The problem here is still the time order. In order to ask people about their criminal activities, you'd have to gather retrospective data, meaning you have to ask them about something in their past. We know that human memory is far from perfect, and asking people to recall things like their thought process before stealing could lead to some misremembered and inaccurate data. The solution to this type of study is the longitudinal study, where you talk to each person two or more times. This allows the researcher to ask about perceptions of stealing at one age and then learn about their criminal behavior at a later date. Now the problem with this type of study is that perceptions change all the time. You may be certain that you're going to get caught and then your best friend tells you that you've, she's committed the same offense and she's never gotten caught. Bam! Your perception has changed and now you aren't sure whether you will get caught or not. It's very difficult to identify those perceptional changes, particularly for criminal behavior, because we don't know when you're going to commit a crime, so we can't make sure we survey you directly before you engage in criminal behavior. Some of the best longitudinal studies have followed, or even continued to follow, people for several decades, but most of these research studies involve only one or two communications a year. You can imagine that your perceptions and attitudes will change a lot over the course of a single year, particularly when you're studying juvenile offenders. Because of this issue, criminologists have also created a fourth type of research study called vignette research. Vignette research consists of a hypothetical situation and then a series of questions about the scenario. For example, a participant in a vignette study might be asked to read about a potential situation in which the participant is walking down an empty corridor and sees an open door to an office. Inside the office, the participant sees an iPad sitting on top of the desk. After reading about the situation, the participant would then be asked a series of questions, such as, would you go into the office to take the iPad? And what is your first thought when you see the iPad? 
Things like that. The advantage of vignette research to the other studies mentioned is that it allows us to identify your thought processes directly before you engage in a criminal act. However, the major disadvantage to vignette research is that it's hypothetical and it may provoke different answers. It's one thing to read in a vignette scenario that you don't have money to pay your rent, and it's another thing when you're actually facing eviction in real life. What you can see from all four types of studies is that each has its advantages and disadvantages. Because of this, proving a theory using multiple studies and multiple research methods will provide us with the best validity. So what have we learned about deterrence since those early days of Vicaria and Bentham? Several important things have been identified using the methods we just discussed. For one, we have found that there is an experiential effect on deterrence, meaning that people's perceptions of punishment will change based on their previous behaviors. That makes sense. Consider your textbook's discussion about drunk driving. Most drunk drivers drive drunk frequently before they are caught, meaning that they know it is likely they will get away with it. The Center for Disease Control found that people drive an average of 80 trips while impaired before they're arrested for drunk driving. Because of that, people considering driving drunk are unlikely to see the punishment of drunk driving as certain, and thus the deterrence effect of any penalty is not very high. The same holds true with white-collar offending. Offenses like tax fraud have a low identification and prosecution rate, so someone who has been cheating on taxes in the past is likely to continue to do so, regardless of the penalty, because they perceive the chances of getting caught as low. The impact of this experiential effect is important because deterrence research has also shown us that when individuals consider the punishments before they act, the certainty of the punishment is more important than the severity of the punishment. So we as a society can keep enhancing and enhancing the penalties for different behaviors, but if an individual knows that the particular crime type is unlikely to be caught by authorities, then the sanction will not result in a strong deterrent effect, no matter how enhanced it is. The last and probably most significant finding that has arisen from modern deterrence research is the differentiation between formal and informal deterrence. Formal deterrence occurs from official sources, such as the government and the courts. As we've talked about in previous lectures, most of our criminal justice system is based on the idea of formal deterrence, providing punishments that correspond to the crime severity in hopes of providing a specific and a general deterrence effect. Laws like street three strikes penalties are based on a deterrence philosophy because they provide an official sanction to an undesirable behavior. However, modern research supports the idea of deterrence coming from outside the formal government as well. Called informal deterrence, this type of deterrent effect comes from things or people that are outside of the official realm, such as family, friends, work, and school. Most importantly, researchers have, have, most importantly, researchers have found that informal deterrence factors are more effective than formal deterrence factors in changing behavior. This supports the need to look outside of the criminal justice system for effective behavioral control. The new research on deterrence led to the formation of the Rational Choice Theory, first published by Cornish and Clark. Social economics, which is described as the study of decision-making, influenced this theory. Like other classical theories, Rational Choice Theory argues that people analyze the pros and cons of their behavior before engaging in criminal activities, and it emphasizes the use of deterrence. Unlike early classical theorists, however, Cornish and Clark's theory provided for the influence of informal deterrence as well as official deterrence. In fact, researchers studying rational choice theory find that many important deterrents result from informal factors rather than formal ones. These informal factors include the reaction of self and others to the behavior and the expected benefits of the behavior. As expected, if you perceive that your self-image will be diminished by the behavior, resulting in feelings such as feeling ashamed, or losing your confidence, then you are more likely to be deterred from committing the offense. Similarly, if you expect that the reaction from others, including your peers, your family, your work, and your school environment, will be negative, then you are more likely to be deterred from committing the offense. Finally, in parallel with the early classical theorists' idea of weighing pros and cons, 
Research suggests that having expectations of large benefits from the crime will make you more likely to engage in the criminal behavior. Cohen and Felsen's 1979 Routine Activities Theory is one of the most common examples of modern day classical theory. In their theory, Cohen and Felsen proposed that criminal offending occurs when criminal makes a rational decision to commit a crime. In particular, they argue that a crime is most likely to be committed when three elements align at a single place in time. The three elements Cohen and Felsen identified were a motivated offender, a suitable target, and a lack of guardianship. One of the things that made routine activities theory unique was its emphasis on the spontaneity of crime. Rather than arguing that people are predisposed or plan out their criminal behavior in advance, Cohen and Felsen's theory suggested that crime was more the result of a snap decision by an offender. They do use the word motivated offender, suggesting that not everyone would engage in crime under the same circumstances. Remember that's one of the limitations of several social theories, such as social disorganization, because the same environment can produce both non-offenders and offenders. However, Cohen and Felsen did not elaborate on what specifically creates a motivated offender versus a normal person, so it's often used in conjunction with another theory to provide the motivation component. If you assume a motivated offender, though, Cohen and Felsen's theory is that the person will take advantage of a situation in which there's a suitable target, meaning someone or something that appears vulnerable to criminal activity, as well as a lack of guardianship. Felsen and Eck have done some subsequent expansions to the original theory, eventually resulting in the crime triangle that you see pictured here. One of the key revisions you will notice is that instead of the original three concepts, offender, target, and guardian, the expansions propose that there are three types of guardians, all of whom serve as deterrents for different elements. These three individuals are known collectively as controllers. The handler is someone who can deter the offender from committing the offense, essentially removing the motivation. Sometimes this is used in accordance with social bonding theory, with the handlers being intimate persons in the offender's life, and other times the handler represents a formal control, such as a community supervision officer. The guardian role is dedicated to protecting the victim, much like the original theory. And then the other new role is the manager, who is dedicated to protecting the location. Several crime reduction policies have resulted from this conceptualization of routine activities theory. Aside from programs that aim at reducing offender motivation through strong handler relationships, routine activities theory suggests that interventions aimed at improving a guardian presence or a manager presence can also reduce crime. For example, a college campus program where you can request a security guard escort late at night would provide a guardian for the victim, reducing the vulnerability of the target. Similarly, putting a security guard at the entrance to the store would provide a guardian against violent activity and shoplifting. What is interesting to me is the role of the manager controller. In his 1994 dissertation, Drug Markets and Drug Places, Eck proposed that the manager of a location, such as a store or restaurant, could put into place practices that serve to protect the place from criminal activity even before the offender and the victim converged in time and space. This could be as simple as a manager hiring a security guard for his place of business, but it could also be more complicated, such as arranging the layout of a store in a particular way, or installing security cameras to protect against theft. Managers can also, by their own presence, serve as guardians for the victim as well, so they can take on a dual role. So what types of policies do the theories in this chapter suggest? Well, like early classical theories, the focus on a rational, free-thinking offender means that policies based on deterrence research should aim at altering the pros and cons for the criminal behavior. Rational choice theory suggests that the best policies are those that focus on increasing informal deterrence. Things such as shaming penalties are done in order to create negative reactions from your peers and family members in the hopes that this will deter your future criminal behavior. As noted earlier, another intervention based on rational choice theory is three strikes policies, where offenders are given a life sentence on their third felony charge, regardless of the actual charge itself. Proponents argue that an offender, faced with a lifetime punishment, will refrain from engaging in criminal behavior because of the severity of the punishment. However, 
Researchers have found little support for the deterrent effect of such sanctions, and critics argue they may actually increase harm under the assumption that the offender becomes more motivated to eliminate witnesses to his or her crimes. Routine activities theory suggests that we focus on strengthening controllers to reduce crime, meaning that we provide more guardians, better handlers, and more effective managers. As discussed in the previous slide, things like adding video cameras, adding security alarms or security guards, establishing a buddy system, and other such interventions can be used to reduce criminal opportunities under this theory. That completes the Contemporary Classical and Deterrence Research Lecture. By now, you should have a good understanding of modern deterrence research, including Cornish and Clark's Rational Choice Theory and Cohen and Felsen's Routine Activities Theory.